Right then, let's get started. Uh, hello everyone, my name's Tom. Um, I uh, am a software engineer and I work on something called Cortex. It's a horizontally scalable version of Prometheus. Um, so uh, I wanted to give a shout out to a few other guys who are here. So we've got Aaron and we've got Mark. We don't have Jono, but these are the other guys that work on uh, Cortex. So put your hand up, Aaron, come on, and Mark. So if you have any questions, talk to them or me. Um, Cortex is open source, so all the source code's there. Um, I've been asked to install a driver. Anyway, yeah. So, audience participation. I take it because you're all here, you're all using Prometheus, right? So everyone get your hands up. Okay. Not, not everyone's using Prometheus. Why are you here, sir? Because I want to know more about it. Oh, that's a good, good answer. Good answer. Who else didn't put their hand up? Well, you put your hand up now. No, I'm joking. I won't single you all out. I just like to, you know, get a bit of uh, movement into the room. So, why Cortex? What are we trying to do? The, in the Prometheus world, the high availability story is that you run two Prometheuses and you mirror all of your data between the two. Um, your two Prometheuses, this is one of the benefits of the pool-based model that Prometheus has. Your two Prometheuses scrape all your jobs and then you have your Grafana and you point it at one and when that goes wrong, you point it at the other one. Um, and Alerting's got actually a, a nice high availability story as well. This is really good because it's simple and then simple means reliable. Um, it's also really good because it makes it easy to deploy, it's easy to operate, it's easy for the Prometheus developers to develop. Um, however, like, I don't, I don't want to be too down on Prometheus. Prometheus is one of the best pieces of software I've ever had the luck of working on. Um, and the model this offers is, is exceptional. Um, but this does make certain durability and availability kind of compromises, right? You're basically limited to the availability and durability of the two machines you're running Prometheus on. And if they fail, that's it. This actually gets slightly better with the, the stuff that Fabian's going to talk about, because you can back it up. But, but I'm, I'm going to let Fabian talk about that. And what's more, if one of them fails, or if you have an intermittent failure, you end up with gaps in your graphs. Um, and what we really wanted to do at Weaveworks was solve some of these problems and offer effectively just a different set of trade-offs when it comes to durability and availability. What's more like one of the... One of the trends in software engineering in general, I'm sorry for the quality of my slides, they're pretty bad. Um, but yeah, one of the things we wanted to do uh, at Weaveworks and one of the general trends in, in software engineering is like just using services that other people offer. Like very few people nowadays are running their own monitoring. No one runs Hadoop anymore really. Like everyone just lets someone else deal with the hard stuff for them. And that allows you as a, as a, as a company to focus on your core value. Well. We think, uh, we've worked, we think one of the things that you could do is outsource your monitoring. You know, people are already doing this with Datadog and other monitoring as a service, and we think Prometheus as a service would be a really cool thing to offer. So you can go and buy that from Weaveworks now, and it's all backed by Cortex, so I'm going to focus on Cortex and, and how that's done. Um, we also wanted to offer like an alternative set of trade-offs, as I said, to, to durability. Like we would like there not to be graph, uh, gaps in your graphs when a machine fails. We would like availability and, and retention not to be tied to like a single physical machine. We would like retention to be a lot longer. Like in the current Prometheus 1.x, retention really should be limited to kind of three to six months. And in very few circumstances, if you really know what you're doing, you can run it at longer than that. And I, with Prometheus 2, which Fabian's going to talk about, that gets a lot better. But we would like it to be virtually infinite. Like we see no reason why there shouldn't be, you know, why there should be a cap on how much data you can retain. And then there's a few other system, a few other opportunities. Once you get into kind of running something as a service, we get opportunities to do statistical multiplexing for queries. So we should be offered, we should be able to offer better query performance. So that's what we wanted to do. The requirements for this for Cortex were to be completely API compatible with Prometheus, 100%. And we kind of got mostly there, I, th I believe. We wanted it to be cost effective to run. Um, one of the one of the things you notice if you look at the monitoring space is the SaaS providers offer a very low initial like figure, like in the tens of dollars a month. And to be able to do what Prometheus does at tens of dollars a month is hard. You know, Prometheus is known for doing thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of samples a second. Right? If you took each one of these samples and wrote them to a distributed database, your cost, of, your cost per customer would be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a month, because these distributed databases are are hard to operate and are expensive. So really like the thing we focused on most with Cortex was making this thing cost effective to run. So the other thing, you know, Weaveworks is a small team. 
Um, and, and really it was just myself and Jono and, and more recently Aaron and Mark working on this. So we wanted it to be really easy to operate. This is going to be operated by a very small number of people. And we wanted it to scale thousands of users. We're not quite there yet, but, but it does scale pretty well. So do not fear, like we did this because at Weaveworks we wanted to sell this and make money, but it's all open source. That's the Weaveworks way. Um, we also kind of not mentioned on here is we want to support multiple users simultaneously on the same system. So we wanted a multi-tenant system that partitions the user data safely and, and can pretty much guarantee not to leak users' data. We also wanted to practice some of, um, some of the like, you know, cloud native best practices. So we wanted to be, uh, you know, we want to be stateless as much as we can. We wanted to do the whole cattle not pets thing. You know, we run this all on Kubernetes, so everything's modeled as, service, as microservices, and we're using gRPC, and we're doing distributed tracing. We're using all of these cool techniques to really, like, try and make ourselves more successful. So a bit of a, bit of a timeline. We started this project a year ago, actually, almost a year ago to the date. Um, uh, Julius Voltz, one of the other Prometheus core developers, and I started this. Julius was paid to, so was I. Um, we started the design doc. We actually circulated the design doc on the Prometheus mailing list and made our intentions like publicly clear. This is what we're doing. And we received from, from Fabian and from the, one of the other developers, Bjorn, received really high quality feedback that really did shape the architecture we ended up with. So it's their fault. Um, we launched it a few months later at the first PromCon, which uh, Matt alluded to. Um, I gave a very similar talk to this. This is basically just an evolution of that. And, uh, and that, it basically, from, it was running in, in development about a month before that. But from then on, it's been running in production. So we've been running it for about 10 months. Um, it originally started as a fork of Prometheus that we just kind of hacked together and got it done as quickly as possible. But after, after PromCon, we decided to focus on, you know, being a bit less of a hack. So we split it into its own repo. We invested a lot of time and effort in kind of paying back some technical debt that we'd accrued in the, the kind of first two month spike to get it, get it uh, written. And then earlier this year, we launched uh, hosted alerting. So we've got a hosted multi-tenant alert manager. We've got uh, what we call the ruler service, which sits there and evaluates recording rules and alerts. And then today I'm giving a talk at London Meetup. I always like to include today. Um, but it's always fun. You can see the name when we first started it is different to Cortex. Frankenstein's not a very friendly name, um, so we changed it to Cortex. But it's always fun to go back and read the original design doc from a year ago and see how much of it was, was, was correct and see how much of it was, you know, kind of a bad idea. And I think we did reasonably well. Like, I read it recently, and most of what's in there is, is actually what we ended up doing. But now for the nitty-gritty of the talk. So this really is, I gave, as I mentioned, I gave at PromCon a like, this is what we're doing for Cortex, and isn't this cool? And basically, the rest of the talk is, well, this is what I got wrong. And this is what I learned from running it for the last 10 months. So this is the evolution of Cortex. This is what it was in August last year. It was uh, a small number. It was effectively two services. I'm, I, I would normally come and point at the stage, but I, I'm going to stay in front of the mic at this point. So the first thing you'll notice is you can't scrape third-party jobs from the cloud because of firewalls. Um, so the first thing we did is we used an open source vanilla Prometheus to scrape your jobs. And Julius and I added a remote write API to Prometheus, which allows Prometheus, with a little bit of configuration, to send samples to other systems. And this has actually gone on to be super useful for integrations with InfluxDB, for integrations with OpenTSDB. There's, there was just a new one announced. Actually, Matt, you wrote one recently as well, didn't you? Like, was that using the, re the remote write API as well? Or? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's proxy that supports the API. Oh, OK, sorry. But yeah, like there, there's a whole bunch of people out there now developing new and interesting integrations using this remote write API, and more recently, a remote read API as well. Anyway, so you deploy Prometheus in your own data center. You configure it to send samples to, to us. It goes through some front end. You know, For all intents and purposes, that's just an Nginx. It might do a bit of authentication, and that's not part of Cortex. And then eventually, it writes to what we call the distributor. So the distributor is a service running on Kubernetes. And it's just presented as a normal Kubernetes service, so we don't get to decide where, which replica of that service the request ends up at. It's just going to end up at a random replica. And it's at that point that we, we do a little bit of, of custom routing, and we route the request to an ingester that's for that given time series. So we use consistent hashing. We're very similar to the kind of Cassandra scheme to pick the ingester for a given, uh, for a given time series and forward all the samples to that ingester for that given time series. So that's the job of the distributor. 
the ingester then receives all the samples for a given time series. I mean, we don't run millions of ingesters. You can imagine an ingester receiving more than one time series. But the locality that the distributor injects into its routing means that we can do batching in the ingester. So the ingester then batches up all, the, all these samples into a chunk. And if anyone here is familiar with the Prometheus storage system, you'll recognize these chunks are the same. I mean, we literally use the Prometheus code to build the chunks. Prometheus has a fantastic storage layer that allows you to um, compress like 128 byte samples down into like 1.25 bytes. Like it's fantastic when it comes to compression. And so we use exactly the same code. We literally just vendor it in from the Prometheus library to build our chunks. And then we flush these chunks to S3. We run in Amazon. So the chunks get stored in S3. An index, an inverted external memory index over these chunks gets stored in DynamoDB. And they also get cached in memcache. Console sits here as a consistent key value store to store the consistent hash ring. So different, different meanings of consistent there. Um, but basically, it just is an extra bit of um, an extra metadata store that we store our routing tables effectively in. I'm not going to go into how we do consistent hashing just yet because I could spend a whole hour talk just on consistent hashing. Um, or the replication scheme. We use a Dynamo style replication, which is not the same as DynamoDB. Amazon managed to confuse everyone by calling DynamoDB DynamoDB. Dynamo is the original paper from Amazon about their eventual consistent uh, cart system which is really, really right available. DynamoDB is their fully consistent SSD-backed uh, big table or Cassandra lookalike. So that's what we launched with in August. Um, the first thing we did is we added what we call the table manager. Now, the table manager, we, with DynamoDB, you, you provision a fixed amount of throughput, and you pay for that. So you come along and we say, oh, we want you know, 20,000 writes a second, please, to DynamoDB, and that's what we get billed for. From the ingester, we don't, you know, we can't necessarily actually achieve full utilization of that. And at the beginning, we found we were only achieving about 30% utilization before we were being throttled. The challenge here was, um, it's quite nuanced actually. In DynamoDB, when you say, please give me 10,000 a second, and it works out based on various parameters that that will be 10 shards, and it actually then gives you 1,000 a second on each shard. If your write load onto the DynamoDB table isn't 100% uniform, then say you're just writing to a single row in DynamoDB, you can max out your provision throughput by just doing 1,000 writes a second, so only getting 10% utilization. And we were effectively suffering from these kind of problems. So we did a series of um, changes to the schema to get much better uh, distribution of our writes to DynamoDB. And then the next thing we did is we introduced a table manager which rotates tables every week. So you get a fresh set of tables, because the problem here was over time, you get more and more shards, and the request rate per shard goes down. Um, so if you just rotate your tables out every week, you stay with roughly a constant number of shards. And after this change, we were getting 90-ish percent utilization on our DynamoDB. Bear in mind, at the very beginning, requirement number two is making this thing cost-effective to run. DynamoDB is our biggest cost for running this thing. So you know, the difference between 30% and 90% is huge. Like, makes it a third of the uh, price, right? So that was the next change we, uh, we made. Now, after this, we noticed, as uh, you probably noticed, I've, I've highlighted the read and the write paths in uh, red and blue. The beginning, the query, uh, the query engine was embedded in the distributor. If you did a query, it hit the distributor. The distributor would go and talk to the ingester and receive the in-memory data and talk to the um, chunk store, is what I refer to the collection of services at the bottom, and receive the out-of-memory data. And then it would merge it and respond to the user. One of the things we noticed, or, or people told us, was that um, you could send us queries of death. If you send us queries that caused the service to fail, then it would reboot, and there'd be a period, uh, an outage, right? Now, the consistency scheme allowed this to not be too much of a problem, but if you sent us two or three successively, and they all hit different uh, distributors, then yeah, you could cause a big outage. So we separated out the write path and the read path. This is where the microservices really kick in. Um, it gets more complicated. So it turns out, actually, the distributor and the query are the identical binaries. Um, they run exactly the same code. We just, in the routing layer in the front end, we just route different queries to one, and we read queries to one and write queries to another. And that works surprisingly well. This allowed us to isolate the write path so that if you did send us a query of death, it wouldn't affect write availability. We'd still be recording your data. And then over time, because it's much more isolated, we got rid of all of the known queries of death, obviously. Um, 
The querier needs to know about the consistent hash ring, which is stored in console, so that's why that dotted line's there. And it needs to read from everything, which is why the blue lines are there. We introduced alerting and recording rules. So another job called the ruler, which sits there and periodically evaluates the recording rules you tell us to evaluate. Everyone's familiar with what a recording rule is? Nope. Okay, so a recording rule in, in Prometheus is a, uh, an expression that gets periodically evaluated and then saved under a new name. So for instance, in Prometheus, say you have some histogram expressions that might hit a very high cardinality time series. So your histograms might take, you know, 10 seconds to evaluate because you've got to fetch a lot of data and you've got to do a lot of computation. Now, if you're using that histogram to, um, the histogram percentile to, uh, histogram quantile, sorry, isn't it? Yeah. If you're using a histogram quantile to, like, render a dashboard, you don't want your dashboards to take tens of seconds to load. So Prometheus has this facility for recording rules where you can have them evaluated in the background and then your reads just hit from your dashboards just hit a single or a small number of uh, time series and, and it, it's fast for your dashboards. So up till now, Cortex didn't support that, and so we added this ruler, which sits in the background, ingests uh, recording rules in exactly the same format as Prometheus, because remember, we're trying to achieve a high degree of compatibility here, and would evaluate them. And then it would write them back to the ingester, which would include them in chunks that would eventually get flushed to the chunk store. So this was good. This made our dashboards loading via Cortex much, much quicker. Um, some other jobs which we added. Let me have a look here. Yeah, right back to the ingester. So the final change we made was to stop writing chunks to S3. Um, turns out Amazon services are interesting because they've basically priced, if you get through the varying degrees of pricing information they give you, they've effectively priced S3 IOPS at a couple of order of magnitude higher than DynamoDB IOPS. So every single time you read or write from S3, you're paying more, you know, 10 to 100 times more than you would if you that read or write from DynamoDB. On the flip side, they've made S3 gigabyte, dollars per gigabyte 10 times lower than they have for DynamoDB. So it's just a different trade-off. You know, DynamoDB is more expensive to store stuff in, but cheaper to read and write it from. And S3 is more expensive to read and write from, but cheaper to store stuff in. And this is the kicker. And remember, with Cortex, it's all about making it cost-effective to run. So once we notice this, I suppose the missing piece of information here is that we're writing one kilobyte values, which is a bit of a pathological case for S3, right? The chunks are only a one kilobyte large, and, and reading and writing them through S3 not only was expensive, but really slow. At very small values, like the 99th percentile uh, read and write latency to S3 is like a second, which sucks. So that's why we had memcache in there. It didn't really affect us too much, but we moved the chunk storage of the actual chunks into a different table inside DynamoDB alongside the indexes. That reduced the cost of running the system by about 50%. Um, we spend more on storing those chunks, but we spend less on reading and writing them. And so that actually ended up reducing the storage. And this, yeah, and this is the system as it stands today. There's also a couple of things I haven't mentioned. We have a multi-tenant version of Alert Manager for sending, um, oh, not receiving, but for sending alerts. Um, and it has, it's effectively the same upstream alert manager code, just in a little wrapper so that we can inject user IDs. Um, that would sit somewhere off to that side. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the system as it stands today. I could go into a lot more detail on the consistent hashing, if people would like, and the replication scheme, or I can move on. What do you reckon? I'm seeing a lot of blank faces, so I'm going to move on. Yeah. So, a bit of an evaluation. How did, this, how did this go? How did this uh, experiment you know, operate? We've been running for about 10 months. Um, these are the very back of the envelope calculations. So we've been running for 10 months. We had, a query, uh, we had query unavailability for about 12 hours of that 10 months. Um, this is an estimate. And this was when the big S3 outage happened in the East, in the East Coast region. Because we we, our query needs to be able to read from S3. doesn't anymore, but it did now, did then. So based on 12 hours out of the last 10 months, that's about three and a half nines, which is not bad. We wanted to achieve better than that. Um, and, you know, the system when it had the outage was still in alpha, but we'll achieve better than that now. Durability. Well, this is a difficult one to measure because we had four outages uh, that potentially lost data. Now, it's very hard for us to know if we actually lost data or not. And I suspect for only one of those outages, did we actually lose any data, any customer data. But given that there was the potential in four different occasions to lose data, and the ingesters store 12 hours of data, then that means there was potentially up to two days of data lost. Now, in reality, I suspect it's closer to six hours. 
um, which means we would have like three and a half nines uh, or, or even four nines. But, but to be pessimistic, software engineer have to be pessimistic, we're, we're about two and a half nines of durability. And this, uh, this is something we're working on fixing, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, write performance is something I'm very proud of. Um, the 99th percentile write performance for Cortex is, well, it says there, 60 milliseconds, roughly. Uh, and 50 of those milliseconds are spent on the network and traversing the front end and doing authentication and doing all this kind of stuff. So actual writes to Cortex are blazingly fast, um, which they should be, because they just go into memory. Um, the 99th percentile query performance is worse, obviously, because it has to do a lot more. Um, but it's actually something I'm quite proud of as well. We spent a lot of time and effort optimizing the query performance, and it's now 99% of your queries will happen in less than 200 milliseconds on a, on a properly configured Cortex cluster. Um, of that 200 milliseconds, most of it is spent figuring out what to read from the index. You know, because your queries, the way Prometheus does queries is you have to go and read some labels and do some intersections and do some regex matching, and most of the time spent there, and very little of that time is actually spent retrieving the data to, to render to you. And of course, we're losing about 50 milli milliseconds running through a network in the middleware. So there's still some opportunity there to optimize this, and also this only, you know, this only really counts for queries that are hitting like the last few hours of data. The minute you start hitting data that's out of the memcache, so after, after the last couple of days, it gets a lot slower. Fair enough. And the minute you start doing very large queries, it gets slow as well. This is similar behavior to Prometheus. Um, one of the things I really want to work on in the future with Cortex is sharding the queries and parallelizing them so that queries that run over, say, you know, the last year are the same speed as queries that run over the last week. I mean, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that. One of the things I just wanted to highlight was uh, this blog post I published on the Weave blog um, about optimizing the write latency for the distributor. So the, the blog post is very long and goes into all the techniques and details I, I use, but Effectively, like by the end of the week, I got it down to 25 milliseconds, and I didn't believe it. So I reverted all my changes, ran it for, what, 20 minutes to see what the old baseline was, and yet I'd, removed, I'd got it down from about 100 milliseconds to 25. So I, I rolled them back out again. I was pretty happy with this change, as you, can, uh, as you can imagine. Now, this is measured at the distributor, so there's the middleware to put on top, which is why I was quoting figures more up here, but yeah, there we go. So what is in the... What is in the future for, uh, for Cortex? Well, uh, one of the things I uh, spent the day with Fabian talking about how Cortex can work with Prometheus better. One of the things we'd really like to do is allow direct writes from Prometheus into the chunk store. Prometheus is effectively doing everything that the ingesters are doing and, and ingesting samples, chunking them up into bigger chunks and then writing them out to the disk. We would like to introduce an interface that allows them to be shipped off into the chunk store that we've developed, which is the, my, my name for the collection of services and the code that reads and writes them at the bottom. Um, and that would allow a, uh, another point on kind of trade-off curve for durability and cost and so on. Like that would give you a nice solution to long-term storage for Prometheus. You know, with the opportunity to lose the last, whatever, 12 hours of data. But on the other hand, it would be super cheap to do. So, so that's something we want to work on. Um, I've been working on, you know, as you've probably seen, Cortex is a collection of like seven or eight services. I've been working on a single, single service, single process version of Cortex that I'd like to roll into to basically just make experimentation and, and development easier. So you just have to run like a couple of these and connect them up to a console server and you get a horizontally scalable version of Prometheus. You know, obviously the downside of this is you don't have the kind of isolation of the read and write path and there's various other challenges here, but, but it's, it should be easier for people to develop on their laptop. Uh, one of the things I'm working on is um, big table support for for the chunk store so that it's not just writing to DynamoDB and S3 and it's not just an AWS specific thing. Um, but I've got a version of Cortex that can write to Bigtable and Google Cloud Storage. Um, on that same line, like there's lots of internal interfaces that can be swapped out for different implementations internally. So I'd really like to see support for etcd instead of console. I'd really like to see support for Cassandra as well as Bigtable. You know, and, and you know, currently we don't have a really good solution for if you want to run Cortex on your own premises and you don't, you're not running in the cloud. So like Cassandra would be a good solution. And I was just talking to someone earlier about running on HBase. Um, the big table interface that Google offers is actually exactly the same as the HBase interface. So it might just work, who knows? Um, ah, yes, I didn't really talk about this at the beginning, but uh, the way I do the consistent hashing was done as a compromise between um, being able to quickly decide where to go on queries and being able to get decent load balancing. Effectively, the input to the consistent hash is the user ID and the metric name. And if any of you are familiar with consistent hashing, you'll recognize that if you need to 
do a query that doesn't involve the metric name, this becomes a challenge because you, you, know, you don't have the metric name as the input to the hash. So this is something Aaron's actually been working on recently. And as an extension to that, you'll also realize that if you only include the metric name and the user ID in the, in the consistent hash, like the cardinality of metric names, of the time series associated with metric names is wildly variable, right? So some metric names will have 20,000 time series or more associated with them, and some will have one. And so if you've got that kind of variability as the input to the hash, the load balancing is not that good from the consistent hash scheme. So by separating out the ingester index, and there's a bit of a design and a bit of a prototype for this already, this should achieve much better load balancing, which should really help scale um, Cortex up to be like, you know, much larger. Right now, if you scaled it up to tens, of, of nodes, you would start to notice a load imbalance across the ingesters. What else have I put on here? Oh, I've got it here. Um, yes, so something Fabian's going to talk about next is using uh, is this new version of uh, Prometheus with its new time series database. And as, as I alluded to earlier, this is effectively doing exactly the same thing, just better, I hope, than, uh, than, it, than Cortex's ingesters. So I'd like to use it. Like in the spirit of working closely with the Prometheus developers, this makes a lot of sense, I think. Thanks very much.